Okay, guys, so we're looking to look at the <clears throat> story from uh, The Things They Carried, How to Tell a True War Story by Tim O'Brien. Um, <clears throat> the three sort of central features of this particular story that are, <clears throat> I think, the distinctive um, prose conventions in this story are uh, narrative digressions, the unorthodox use of narrative voice, and um, the motif of storytelling. All of those features of the, of the narrative itself connect to O'Brien's argument about <clears throat> the necessarily subjective nature of truth and the way that it connects to the authenticity of, of um, depicting the war experience. So <clears throat> again, this motif is, is, uh, forms the first words in the story and that it draws attention to this, this central distinction between story truth, which is O'Brien's kind of um, slang phrase for subjective truth, and then happening truth, which is his slang phrase for objective reality. <coughs> he begins <coughs> with his story about his buddy, uh, Rat Kiley, writing a letter about a friend who died during the Vietnam War to the guy's sister, and the emotive um, intensity of that particular experience. The story itself is a, a constant reflection on um, the nature of writing and storytelling itself and is metafictional in, in, in a great deal of its um, narration. So in the, in the beginning, we have this, this opening anecdote that reflects on the process of narration, which is ironic because it establishes a communicative boundary to be overcome through <clears throat> the, the method of narration. So we have this narrative voice that adopts the voice of a friend, Rat Kiley. In doing so, the narrative voice becomes the spoken um, anecdotal storytelling voice of a Vietnam veteran. And the syntactical structures, which are conversational, and the diction, which is loaded with military jargon and idiom, uh, idioms and, and military slang deliberately uh, it deliberately constructs this barrier between the ordinary citizen reader and the experiences that are being narrated and the purpose of that of this whole story <coughs> is to try and overcome that barrier and so what we're seeing in this opening um, this sort of exposition is I think the, the distance between the war experience and then the reader. So you'll see this a lot of the time in the word choice here. You know, there's offensive racist terminology like gook. There's also military uh, jargon like the word strack, which means, <clears throat> you know, you have someone high, that has high standards above the requirements. That type of language fills the story. And you'll see this further um, throughout. Importantly, any time you hear this direct reference to the process of storytelling, it is a resurfacing of this motif of storytelling as the only way of communicating subjective, accurate truth. But also, <clears throat> it usually functions as a metafictional reflection on the status of writing generally. But if we look at this passage here, this passage here where... We, we hear descriptions of uh, Rat Kiley's <clears throat> recollection in the letter. Most of the language of this is highly, uh, highly uncomfortable for us to read as an ordinary citizen. And this is a challenge, I think, that O'Brien lays down here. You know, we've got phrases like how a brother would always volunteer for stuff nobody else would volunteer for in a million years. There's a hyperbolic language being used here, um, which is a a great point one of my students brought up in class, um, to show the, the, the extremity of this guy's admiration for a friend. Then, like doing recon or going out on these really badass night patrols, you know, this phrasing here is deliberately kind of um, macho. You know, that's not the, the sort of formal way that you would express this. It's, it's, it's deliberately constructing a kind of... Um, an intimacy that's based on highly masculinized sense of camaraderie. But this language is extremely informal, and that's 
partly what I think creates a sense of authenticity. It's stainless steel balls, Rat tells her. You know, this, this language is <clears throat> deliberately idiomatic and, and, you know, based on slang. The guy was a little crazy for sure, but crazy in a good way, a real daredevil, because he liked the challenge of it. He liked testing himself, just man against goop, a great guy, Rat says. <coughs> so we think of all this as a reflection of what <clears throat> O'Brien, in microcosmic form, a small sort of um, model thinks of story writing about war generally, you know, that it's going to challenge your sense of easy, comfortable moral binaries. It's going to be in the authentic language of those who've been through the experience. You know, this language is a reflection, as we see later on in the story, of the, of the challenges and the difficulties and the horrors of having to go through horrific experiences of this nature. Then there's this, again, reflection on the quality of the storytelling and the letter. It's a terrific letter, very personal and touching. Rat almost bores writing it. So we've got here <clears throat> what constitutes truth in O'Brien's storytelling is the emotive quality that it creates and the ability to recreate experience through the lens of emotion rather than um, through the perspective of factual accuracy. <clears throat> he gets all teary telling about the good times they had together, how her brother made the war seem almost fun, always raising hell and lighting up vills and bringing smoke to bear every which way. When you think of this <clears throat> narrative perspective here, what we're, what, we're being what we're being given here in terms of facts is <clears throat> the idea that destroying villages through, you know, torching them with, with uh, flamethrowers <clears throat> and killing the people presumably inside them is, is almost fun. You know, it's, it's something positive to take from this particular experience. So the way that he has lost track of moralistic binaries <clears throat> is deliberately what's creating the barrier between the, the war experience and the ordinary citizen reading it. <clears throat> but this is, a, you know, an unorthodox handling of narrative perspective. He has a great sense of humor, and he goes on to describe this, and this is a similar example. Probably the funniest thing in world history, Rat says, all that gore about 20 zillion dead goop fish. So again, <clears throat> the experiences, are again, narrated in, in jargon about the alienating experiences of, of being a soldier, and the distance that that then creates between the war experience and the ordinary citizen reading it. You know, we have a hard time working out <clears throat> how this is the funniest thing in world history, blowing up a river full of um, fish with uh, a case of hand grenades, and then the offensive, childish language that it's rendered it. But what you're seeing here is the minds of people that, were, that, are, that are immature and inadequately prepared for the horrors of the experiences that they would be confronting in Vietnam. Her brother, he had the right attitude. And again, you know, there's a huge layer of irony in this because, you know, this is the kind of phrase that we would use to describe someone who is doing something that's orthodox and sensible, but we've just seen him talking about blowing up a whole river full of fish with a hand grenade. He knew how to have a good time. On Halloween, this real hot, spooky night, the dude paints up his body all different colors and puts on this weird mask and goes out on ambush almost stark naked, just boots and balls in an M16. So we look at this language in this, it's slang, it's vernacular, it's childish, it's offensive, <clears throat> and it's based on this, invoking this sense of masculine camaraderie um, that is created through this jargon. So the diction choice and the narrative, the language style that O'Brien uses in recollecting this narrative from Rat Kiley is supposed to give us this, this sensation of emotional authenticity, which is again, his vision of what a true war story is. A tremendous human being, Rat says, pretty nutso sometimes, but you could trust him with your life. And again, there's an enormous sort of <clears throat> unremarked on sort of irony, an irony that goes unnoticed in Rat Kylie's story, that he's mad, but you could trust him with your life. Well, that seems to be the sign, not only of the illogical nature of the experience, but his own mental inadequacy for thinking that you could trust your life with someone that is insane. 
you know, that, that is an unusual conclusion to make. And you see here, an, a tremendous human being. This is a highly unusual deduction to, to make from all of this, you know, the impression of this rat Kylie that we've been given through his recollection of the letter. <coughs> but then at the end, we get the, the sort of serious emotive content of this. And then the letter gets very sad and serious. Rat pours his heart out. He says he loved the guy. He says the guy was his best friend in the world. They were like soulmates, he says, like twins or something. They had a whole lot in common. So you see again, the, the, the soldier's actual inadequacy with language. And the fact that they, he, he tries to go for a, a sort of a simile here, but ends up using a cliche that you would use to talk about a romantic relationship. Then goes for something else that suggests they're close, but finds that inaccurate, and then just goes for a really generic observation. And so these sort of flawed figures, these flawed attempts at figurative language, show us again an example of that, that non-referential signification where language is creating meaning, not through its ability to, to reference reality and to capture things accurately, but actually through its failures. We've got the, the highly subjective experience of the deep sense of camaraderie that soldiers would feel towards each other during wartime being invoked through their, their fumbling attempts at trying to describe this experience poetically. And he says he tells this the guy's sister he'll look her up when the war's over. So what happens? Rat mails the letter. He waits two months. The dumb coos never writes back. And if you look at the simplicity here of the syntax, the very simple, single clause declarative sentences that show us this sort of blunt um, style of narration that I think... It's supposed to reflect a kind of bluntness in their mind. You know, this is not necessarily a celebration of the mental traits that you see in this particular narrator, but it is, I think, uh, attempting to get us to understand how this type of thinking emerges and how this sense of alienation um, emerges from the experience of war and then causes problems for soldiers when they attempt to come back into normal life. And we have our first true digression that is also again metafictional it's metafictional reflection it's about storytelling a true war story is never moral <coughs> it does not instruct nor encourage virtue nor suggest models of proper human behavior nor restrain men from doing the things that they have always done if a story seems moral do not believe it and so here you've got this suggestion that, that morality is is negatively correlated to truth that if you hear a clearly sort of moralistic war story, you're not hearing an authentic one. You're not hearing something that truly captures the accurate nature of the experience of conflict because that experience doesn't get clearly rendered in, in binaristic moral categories. If at the end of a war story you feel uplifted or if you made to feel that some small bit of rectitude has been salvaged from the larger waste, and you have been made the victim of a very old and terrible lie. There is no rectitude whatsoever. There is no virtue. As a first rule of thumb, therefore, you can tell a war, stro war story. It's true by its absolute and uncompromising allegiance to obscenity and evil. And now we've got the reflection on what we've just heard. This is a digression that is reflecting on the story that we heard to open this story, which is itself a reflection on story writing. And so we've got here... This, you know, it's true if it's, if it's allied to obscenity and evil. You know, it, it, it speaks in, with obscenities. It uses offensive language. And it <clears throat> accurately reflects the evil nature of the war experience. You know, blowing up um, a river full of fish, setting fire to little hamlets in, in rural Vietnam. These are the accurate descriptions. And the, the narrative digression here, which is itself a metafictional reflection, <clears throat> goes on to talk about the previous story. Listen to Rat Kiley. Coos, he says. He does not say bitch. He certainly does not say woman or girl. He says coos. Then he spits and stares. He's 19 years old. It's too much for him. So he looks at you with those big, gentle, killer eyes and says coos because his friend is dead and because it's so incredibly sad and true. She never wrote back. Now, 
the, the, one of the key things that you have to try and get your head around when reading this story is not to see this as a defense, a moralistic defense of whether it's okay to use this offensive misogynistic terminology, because it isn't. But what it is trying to communicate is, is why it happens. And that's a different thing to trying to excuse it from a moralistic perspective. And the reasons are fairly, you know, convincing. It's not to say that it's okay to do it, but he is young. The experience is overwhelming. And so he looks at you with these big, gentle, killer eyes, and that oxymoron captures the awful tension of young guys at this age completely, completely sort of internally, emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically unprepared for the horror that they're going to experience and be forced to carry out and becoming gentle killers. You know, this oxymoron this captures that sense of why true war stories are obscene, why true war stories don't have moralistic conclusions. And so here, <clears throat> the narrative digression overall communicates the absence of morality that's caused by the horror of war. And it's, the, it's that absence of morality that registers subjective truth. Because this has happened. It is so incredibly sad and true, she never wrote back, that you can formulate this really intensive emotional bond with someone partly because of the horrific nature of the things that you're going through together, and then just reflect that heroism that you see in them to their own family. And as far as you're aware, never receive anything in return, no acknowledgement that they even thought about their son in that way. That is a tragedy. And whether we think it's right or not that he uses such offensive terminology doesn't change the fact that it's a tragedy. <clears throat> you can tell a true war story if it embarrasses you, if you don't care for obscenity, you don't care for the truth. And if you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote. Send guys to war, they come home talking gay. So this is actually one of the most complicated and important bits of the, of the story itself. <clears throat> he says that you can tell the truth of a war story if it makes you uncomfortable, if it embarrasses you, if it exposes human truths that are normally suppressed. Because here what you see in these stories is humanity stripped of its vestiges of civilization. We're not looking at people on their best form here. We're looking at people at their very worst. And that's how you know if it's true. And so <clears throat> what you then see from this last little section is actually quite a complex rhetorical structure that O'Brien is using, I think, to try and make a, a fairly forceful statement about people putting themselves in a judgmental position, a position of judgment about, you know, the immorality of using language like coups and goo, and then voting in a way that ends up sending them to war. You know, he's trying to expose an element of hypocrisy in this, that you can sit there and criticize people for using this language, but then vote in a way that means that people have to go through the experiences that cause them to use that language in the first place. And this is what he says. He says, if you don't care for obscenity, you don't care for the truth. If you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote. And so <clears throat> this structure here where you use a phrase at the end of one clause and use it again at the start of the next, if you don't care for the truth, if you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote, is a rhetorical trope called anadiplosis. It's where you begin, you begin the next clause with the, with the phrase that you ended the last one. And so at that particular point, we see this sort of sequence of, the, if you think this is going to happen, this is going to be the cause. It's a way of articulating very clearly cause and effect. It's a way of saying to people, don't get on your moral high horse. Don't become um, judgmental about these individuals until you've thought about what you're doing when you vote. If you're sending people into the White House that are going to send us to Vietnam, you need to watch how you vote if you're going to get on your moral high horse about people speaking in this way and telling the truth about the obscenities of their experience. <clears throat> this is what he says, send guys to war, they come home talking dirty. And this is typical of his particular style of narration, the, the language choice here. But we've got this profound truth, I think, you know, that if you put people through these harrowing experiences, the way in which they communicate those experiences is going to be 
extremely uncomfortable, the medium that they used, language, to communicate those experiences is going to be tainted by the experiences themselves. And so that profound truth is revealed in this quite blunt, um, colloquial, almost military jargon <clears throat> that shows us that the language that we use isn't the only register of profundity, of depth, of significance, and of moral accuracy. This is listen to rap. Jesus Christ, man, I wrote this beautiful fucking letter. I slave over it. And what happens? The dumb coos never writes back. Here, he's asking us to reflect on Rat Kylie's speech. So we think about the layers of recollection that we've got in this story. We've got a narrator rec recollecting a friend who is himself recollecting a moment where he recollected the nature of a particular character. So we've got four or five degrees of separation between the narrative voice telling us this and the actual incident in Vietnam that they're describing. So we've got an enormous amount of separation, lots of chains in us as the readers and the event itself in Vietnam. The event itself is in Rat Kylie's experience, which is represented in a letter, which he recollects to Tim O'Brien's narrator. Tim O'Brien's narrator then recalls that particular moment of him recollecting his own letter. And then we are given that recollection. It's five layers, five steps of removal from the actual objective fact of Rat Kylie dying in Vietnam. And that distancing, you know, where the truth, the objective truth is contained almost inside a sequence of Russian dolls, you know, one inside the other, is a way of telling us, well, let's look at not just the thing itself, but the human registering of that experience and the way that that experience is communicated from person to person and the role that storytelling plays in attempting to deal with that experience. So that's what you're seeing through these particular narrative techniques of this, the motif of storytelling, which keeps coming back over and over again in the story. The <clears throat> narrative digressions that are used to reflect on the stories that are taking place within the story. And um, the unusual handling of language and the narratives, uh, the sort of speaking voice of this narrator. All of those distinctive features are the features of this story that, that mark it out as unique.